Welcome to the Berlin Drawing Room. So today we have a special class planned on painting a yellow wildflower. And um, it's also, we Thank do you. these free classes on a, on a pretty regular basis, rotating between topics and instructors at the Berlin Drawing Room. Um, the Berlin Drawing Room is, is an independent art school located in Berlin, Germany, um, where we teach in-person classes, but we've also been teaching online classes. And we do these free classes like almost every month. And we just decided that um, given the current global situation and the war in Ukraine that we could use the free class format as a way to also raise awareness. Um, so we chose a specific organization that I'm gonna be talking about during the class today. And um, I'll be giving more information on that a little bit later. So my, my wish, my request um, would just be that if you like this class, if you feel like um, by the end that you got something out of it um, or it just gave you a good feeling that you, um, that you make a donation to this organization that's really amazing called um, Artists at Risk because they are helping artists um, that are displaced by war. And we just thought, um, you know, they're a really, they're a small organization and they're, they're quite niche helping artists. But, you know, we thought that everybody knows about the, the great work, important work that's being done by um, the Red Cross or by UNICEF. So we just thought given that, um, that we are an independent art school run by artists, everyone involved in our organization is a practicing artist, um, that we would just bring this very specific organization into focus because probably it's something uh, you might not have heard about. So you are totally welcome to participate in the class, um, whether you have an interest in um, our fundraiser or not. But um, if you do, or maybe if you just um, learn about it here and tell somebody else about it later, um, yeah, we're just happy to, to raise awareness for this organization. So, so with that, I'm actually, um, I want to start out by making sure that everyone um, has access to the reference image for today's class. I'll give myself a slightly more, because I'm excited about today's class because it's like a, a little bit different. And I don't know, I'm excited to be able to connect right. our topic of wild flowers okay. to like, um, bigger issues, but I'll just say a little bit more about myself as well. Um, my name is Mira. So I'm the founder of the Berlin Drawing Room, and I'm also um, the instructor for the Botanical Watercolor Workshops. Um, kind of my area of expertise. So I'm going to go right now. Um, yeah, so this is the Berlin Drawing Room website. And you, if you found the Zoom link, you should have all also been able to find the link to the, um, to the reference image because it is linked there in the email. But if not, um, you can go to our homepage Click on blog, um, fundraiser, wild color, watercolor class. And then here, um, here you've got the reference image. 
that we are all going to be working from today. And um, here you also have the information on how to donate to artists at risk. So again, I'm not enforcing this in any way. Um, it's, um, it's my suggestion that you donate to this organization if you enjoy this class. Um, I don't know, five euros, 20 euros, um, 50 euros. I don't know <laughs> how much you're going to like the class or how much, uh, how important you think this cause is. But um, I'll just quickly read their description because um, once we get to painting, I think we'll just be really super hyper focused on that. So, um, Art at, artists at Risk works with artists around the world, including those affected by war and crises, such as those in Ukraine and Afghanistan. We focus on helping artists to safety and placing them in welcoming artist communities. Your support will directly benefit artists fleeing war and persecution in the form of emergency resources, travel aid, and residencies help support our nonprofit organization, help artists in danger. So I'm not taking um, the, or the donations to myself. I'm not taking a cut from it. In fact, all I'm asking you to do is donate directly to Artists at Risk. So all I've done is link to their donation here. So that is completely um, your choice, if you donate, how much, um, completely up to you. And um, like I said at the beginning, if some people joined later, it's not that I think this is, um, that we should only be helping artists or that this is necessarily like um, the only most important thing to do. It's just that um, I wanted to focus on something a little bit more niche that you might not already know about, such as UNICEF or Red Cross. Um, other organizations that are doing amazing work. Um, I just thought something that directly relates to what we do with the Berlin Drawing Room, which is also to work with artists and support artists, um, struck a chord for me. And, um, and I've talked to the people in this organization. Um, I know that they're also like a smaller organization and they're really working um, directly with these artists in crisis. So um, yeah, so all that information, how to donate, this just takes you directly to their page. Um, it leaves my hands at that point. And um, if you want to add a, a note, if you want to write Berlin Drawing Room in your you know, payment note, it would be nice just so that they know um, that we were thinking of them during this class. And yeah, they know we're doing this. So I'm sure they'll, they would be excited about that. Um, okay, I just noticed some notes in the chat here. Um, lots of greetings from different parts of the world. That's always nice. Um, the size of the paper is um, pretty much up to you. Um, any size that you can fit this flower on. So actually can probably be relatively small, even postcard size. Um, or I'm using a, like an A4 letter size paper, but I probably won't use the whole sheet. Um, okay, like, wow, Finland, India, Canada, USA. Um, so great, okay. Um, I won't necessarily be able to check the chat um, like all the time while I'm painting. So if you do have questions um, at any point about what I'm doing um, while I'm painting, um, it's um, completely fine to unmute yourself and also just interrupt me and ask a question. Um, can we share this link? Robin asks, yes, absolutely, um, please do. That would be wonderful. Um, okay, so
so yeah, and then right here is the reference image. Um, you can just use it directly from the blog. You can download it onto your computer. Um, that's up to you. Paris and your guys here trying to rectify what the building is going to be called about. Okay. But sure. well, the I want the report that the um, building and safety gave you because basically sometimes when we have a bigger group like this, it's hard to find whoever's talking. Figured it out. Um, so yeah, for today, um, really like any size watercolor paper, as long as it's 300 grams, that's kind of important for the layering process. And um, I think any basic set of watercolors is going to um, work well for you today. Um, I put it in the materials list that I hope you all received um, earlier that there is one kind of special color that I'll be using today, which is this Kernacridone purple. Um, it just works really well. I'll talk about why for this technique. But um, if you don't have that, I'll talk about some alternatives. <clears throat> So at this point, um, I've been talking a while. Is there anyone that still has not been able to access the reference image and needs help? Um, My reference picture, I can only see the bottom third of the picture. Perfect, um, thank you. That seems like it might have be an issue with your device actually, so. Not really. Uh, why, uh, what I would suggest is that you um, you try to download the image versus viewing it on our website. It could have some display issues with different people's um, device formats. If you download it and put it into wherever you view photos, um, you should be able to see it like any other photo. <clears throat> um, Okay. Very good. So I'm going to switch to uh, my desk view. Oops. To make that more. Um, okay, so just wanted to say a couple things about the topic for today. Um, yellow flowers, the color yellow can present some challenges. I just need to find somebody to mute again. Oops, okay, I think it went away. Um, because so normally when we um, we're painting a flower that has like lots of different parts and lots of different petals, uh, we use the shadows in order to distinguish these different shapes from each other. So we use the shadows as a way to build up structure. And um, with the color, we usually also, because oftentimes we're, um, we're used to viewing these objects with a warm light source, we tend to want to have cooler colored shadows. So that means um, more blue. Um, however, just try to make this a little closer. Um, when we add um, too much blue to the shadow layer with a yellow flower, the problem is that it turns green. Um, and when you look at a yellow flower, um, optically, you know, we don't see green shadows. Um, you know, we, I guess 
Optically, we don't necessarily even notice the color of the shadow. But of course, when we're painting something, uh, we need to pay especially close attention to that. Um, so, okay, if we make the shadow color too blue, we're gonna end up with green, green flower, not a, not a yellow flower. Um, conversely, if we make it too warm, um, say we just need to go in the other direction. And here, um, and here uh, it's a red or purple. A red or purple. I know somebody, a few of you are unmuted. I'm going to see. I think I can mute you from my end, but it seems to cause all kinds of issues. So, all right. So, here, then what happens is we start to get an orange shadow, and then it looks like we have um, an orange flower. So what we want is something in between that's gonna work really well with the yellow and not turn it into a different color. So this is too blue, this is too red, and here, this is kind of a very pale violet um, that um, tends to work uh, really well for yellow flowers. So we're gonna be, um, this is, the concept that we're going to be working on today has a little bit to do with color theory, um, a lot to do with layering. Um, so, so getting to our specimen, this is just a, a sketch that I did before the class, but we can work on a drawing together. So, and here, I just wanted to start already adding in some of the purple shadows so that you could get a little bit of a preview of the direction that we'll be going in. So, and I also wanted to do this in advance so you can see the scale that we're going for. So um, the flower that we're painting today is a very small flower, but um, I'm just putting my hand here so you can see that I've drawn the flower larger than life, which is just gonna make it easier to get into all these details and also um, to work with the process of layering that's like, important to this class. Um, so, and like in terms of drawing the, the specimen larger than life size, um, we're actually at a little bit of an advantage in that case when it comes to drawing from a photo because you can actually uh, zoom in on your photo. So I really recommend that you, you zoom in on the image so that you can really see it um, largely and clearly on uh, whatever device you're using or if you've printed it um, to print it also um, like a little bit larger than life size. So I'm gonna start out um, with just defining where the center of the flower is going to be with a small circle. I'm going to try to narrate what I'm doing with the drawing because I realize like with watercolor, you really don't want the drawing to be very dark. So it may happen that uh, you can't see my drawing very well because I'm working on it. So I'll, I'll try to explain to you what I'm doing. but. Um, so I'm not drawing all the details here. I just made a kind of oval. Mira, are you able to lift, sort of bring the the projector down so we can see it closer? So we get uh, a closer vision? You know what? I could do that for a moment, but I can't, like, I can't physically draw. Okay. If it's too close. You know right, I mean? sure. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Because I need a little space too <laughs> for my hands. So that's why I've done this drawing in advance so that you can see this, because I knew that, um, you know, it's going to be difficult for you to see my drawing while I'm doing it. So this is what I'm going to do now. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna make sure that all the petals connect to this um, central circle. And, you know, the very first marks that I lay down, the very first shapes that I make, they're gonna determine the scale of the entire rest of the drawing. So it's okay if you see like, oh, the very first petal that I did is too small to so just erase it and start over because you wanna make sure that you get the scale right in the beginning. And I'm using an H pencil. Um, you can also use an HB pencil. It works quite well, but um, you just want the lines to be really light because we're going to be covering them up um, with the paint and yellow is already quite light. I just realized I made these two petals a little bit too big. I'm not that happy with the way that my drawing started out. Just gonna change a few things before while I still can. It can happen sometimes. So just 
We'll make some adjustments now. The way everything looks together. Erase a few extra lines that got accumulated. Mm -hmm. Of course, um, I haven't added the all those shapes in the center yet. So now um, could be my time to do that. So I'm trying to add as much detail at this point as I can. And I'm just drawing everything as an outline. I'm not adding any shading. I'm not adding um, any textural details. This is I'm just adding the parts of the flower. Keep making adjustments to my drawing, but probably fine. Just notice little things and then want to fix it. But okay, I'm sure I'm actually I'm not the fastest drawer, so I'm sure some of you are waiting for me. I find that um, with botanical painting, like one of the really special things about it is just this process of observation. And like the longer you look at something, um, you start noticing more and more detail. Um, sometimes it just makes you want to keep adding more. But okay. So, like I said before, oh, let's get a couple things in the chat. Um, yes, so we're recording. So, as long as the recording turns out um, somewhat decent, I'm hoping that it will then yes, the recording will be available. Um, Anne Perry says, can you put the image in the black box? Um, I can't, I'm, I'm assuming you mean the chat box. I cannot um, deal with the technical issues anymore now that the class has started, but if somebody else um, in the class would be able to do that, that would be um, that would be really nice. So I know sometimes people are eager to help out. Um, 
but I have to now focus on the on the instruction. So thank you, thank you, Alex. Um, okay, so like I said, um, with any kind of three dimensional form like a flower with many different petals going in different directions. What gives it its structure is the, are the shadows. So we're gonna start by painting some shadows like I've already started to do here. And I've already the other door, of course. why we're gonna be using the color, um, this sort of pale violet, why I've chosen that color. So I am mixing this color, starting out with a base of, Quinacridone purple. It's kind of a special color, like uh, not a color that would normally come with your um, watercolor set. And I just like it because it is um, very transparent. And um, I think for this layering process, that works really great. It's also quite light. So um, if you don't have this color, if you've got like a, um, a quinacridone magenta, for example, or um, if you've got any kind of like a permanent rose or um, some kind of like a pink pigment, um, that could be a really nice option to take for mixing your violet instead of, um, Alizarin Crimson, which tends to be a bit darker. But if Alizarin Crimson is all you've got, which is um, basically like the cool red that should be part of any uh, color set, um, you can use that as well. Um, you know, this is kind of like we're practicing this technique together. And if everything isn't 100% perfect, you know, on the first try, like, it's a process, right? Um, but this is the Kernacridone purple. You can see how transparent it is and how light it is. Um, you can also use, um, like if you've got a violet that came with your watercolors, you can also just use that actually. It's probably, could be pretty similar to this. Um, just make sure to dilute it a lot. And yeah, if you don't have any of those fancy colors that I mentioned, <laughs> you can also just use your good old Alizarin Crimson, which is this color mixed with like a kind of transparent mm -hmm. blue of your choice. Um, like maybe this phthalo blue, for example. Um, but you know, we're, we're trying to get to a certain solution. So how you get there um, can be different depending on what you've got at home. But, um, you know, as long as we um, just can get to the same place. Um, so that's why I think it's really good to know like the um, theory behind like why I'm mixing the color the way that I'm doing it so you can understand why I think this works well. And then you can make um, your own decisions like, you know, in whatever moment, if you find a flower that you want to paint and you think like, um, ah, only I had that, this or that pigment um, is kind of a moot point if you don't. So what's important is that you understand like how to mix the colors, right? So, that's my Kernacridone purple, but I realized through the, um, just doing these tests, I realized that this will turn my flower orange. Um, it's too, too much red in there. So you know, I just added a bit of blue. I think I've added a little bit of phthalo blue or cobalt blue. And then I just made it, um, into more of a violet. Um, why did I not just start with a violet pigment? Because like I told you before, I like the transparency of the 
when I put on purple. So this is my reasoning like that I went through, how to get to this solution for the shadow color that I like. But you know what? If you do it in a different way and that works, um, totally fine. It's not about having rules. It's about finding something that works. So what's just so important with yellow flowers is to be really subtle when you start. So you want to dilute your purple to very, very thin. Um, I mean, you can see it here, how, how diluted that is. And this is just so important because it is so easy to overpower um, yellow flower. So uh, a yellow color, sorry. I'm gonna get up this moment here in a few minutes anyway. So I'm gonna start by looking for the darkest shadows. And these are also the ones that are really giving like a lot of definition. Um, so what's really convenient is that when, see, this is too dark what I'm doing, this is too dark. Um, so easy to make it too dark. Especially when I'm talking at the same time. So, What's convenient is that when the flower petals overlap, um, they cast a shadow, the top one casts a shadow. So um, this is great because they both have the same local color. They're both yellow, all the petals are yellow and we need some way of um, separating them. So the shadows are gonna do just that. And like all these small parts, the, the anthers and the stamens, I'm just pretty loosely painting around them. I mean, I'm not like, I'm not going in with a magnifying glass or anything. I'm just kind of avoiding them. And I mean, those are the darkest. So I actually can go for some of the shadows that are inside the petals. I can use an even more diluted purple, like, you know. So I'm just controlling it by always adding more water and I also need to control the amount of water that is on my brush. So when I'm painting something very small and detailed like this, I really don't wanna have um, too wet of a brush. I'm using a, a number two brush, by the way. So kind of a medium sized brush in terms of botanical watercolor. <coughs> and I'm using the paper towel that I've got here to control the amount of water that's on my brush. So, I mean, these shadows are, are really subtle, right? But um, they are there, I guess these petals are kind of curving and they're creating these shadows within the petal. Um, these darker areas like the when the coloring changes on the petals, you might have noticed that I have not dealt with that yet. Um, we're gonna deal with that in a different layer. So, 
you know, I'm more focused on just the shadows. And let's see, we've got these kind of cute little shadows created by the anthers themselves. So I'm going to add those in right, right now too. I might need to, that might be something that later on I need to define again, but I think while I'm doing shadows, I'm just going to put them in there. So for such a tiny shape, I've just got a very dry brush. So that means I've dried my brush completely on the paper towel and then painting onto, um, onto my paper towel. Some of these shadows will maybe continue down here. I know it's a lot of detail, but um, yeah, we're just taking it step by step. Okay, so um, I'd like to add some yellow, actually. We could also work more on the center of the flower, but. Adding some yellow is going to feel rewarding because it's like we want to see what we have, right? It's kind of hard. So um, probably most of you do have like a warm and a cool yellow in your palette. The yellow that I'm using um, is, <laughs> I don't know if this is helpful or unhelpful, but the name of it from um, the manufacturer that I bought it from is called pure yellow. So it's like, well, what does that mean? What does that even mean? But what I think it means, I this pigment that I'm using is sort of uh, in between a warm and a cool yellow, I guess. Um, I can put them. And I think it fits to this flower well, but I think, you know, I could actually switch to a lemon yellow. You know what? I think I am going to switch to a lemon yellow. Now that I see them next to each other, I actually like this more. Okay, so change of plans. I'm going to use a lemon yellow, um, which is relatively transparent um, with the pigment that I'm using. Some yellows can be very opaque, like a cadmium yellow. And so for comparison, here we've got a, um, a warm yellow. So I hope you can see the difference there. This is just a useful thing to be aware of in general. Um, cool yellow, warm yellow, something in between that, um, that is called by the manufacturer Pure. And we're gonna be using, um, for the anthers, we're gonna, we'll use this warm yellow because you can see how the sh color shifts. And that's also why I think I'm gonna stick with the cool yellow now um, to start out with on the petals because it's gonna give me more of a range, um, which is gonna look better. And um, for, for now, for these washes, you really are better off using a transparent yellow pigment. Um, so not a cadmium. If you like, if you don't know what you have and you're like, what is she talking about? I mean, first of all, we're trying out something new today, so just do your best. And second of all, um, if you lay these out, like if you have a few yellows on your palette and you test them out side by side the way I've done, um, you should be able to tell. Like, I mean, it's, I don't know how if you can see from through the screen so great, but like when I look at these three next to each other, to me, it's quite obvious that this is much more opaque 
than the other two colors that I have, um, which are more transparent. And um, yeah, if you aren't sure now, but you want to go to the art supply store later because you think like oh, that's cool, I want to like make sure I have a transparent yellow. Just look on the label of the paint that you're buying and it should give you a rating of how transparent each individual pigment is. Um, transparent, semi-transparent, or opaque. So I'm starting out now with the uh, quite diluted, let me test it out here, a uh, diluted lemon yellow and I'm going to do a flat wash over the whole petal. So I'm going over the purple part. I think I actually made the purple too dark, which is, like I said, really easy to do, but oh well. Let's see how it turns out. Try not to be too harsh on myself. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna move off the petal to petal here. You know, I'm kind of avoiding these um, anthers in the middle just because I want to be able to see them later on. But they are actually a darker yellow than the petals. So it's not going to be a problem if I get lemon yellow pigment on them. Like it's not going to ruin anything. It's a little more challenging when. Um, the organs in the center of the flower are actually lighter than the petals. That's actually harder. Because then you really have to be careful to avoid them. Sometimes you can even use masking fluid for that. I could be using a bigger brush right now. But okay, I'm already using this. Sometimes it's like, get obvious things while I'm talking to you guys. But what I usually like to say is like, use the biggest brush you can for the job. So you should already be noticing by now the way that the colors are blending on the paper. So purple is no longer purple. Um, because like I'm painting directly on top of the areas that I made purple before, going right over them. So purple is no longer purple. Um, it's become kind of a indescribable color. I don't even know, like it's not, is it gray? I mean, it's kind of subjective, right? What do you guys think? It looks like, I guess it's gray. Yeah, I think it's like a gray. Just a minute. <clears throat> So, I mean, that was really rewarding, right? Because it's totally went from being um, purple to, to yellow flower. So, so that's really fun. Um, so in the center here, we've got, um, we've got these yellow spots. Hello. Surrounded by like a lime green. So I'm going to stick with my same um, lemon yellow and add a little bit of blue. I already had some blue on here, so going for it. I think it was cobalt blue, but actually. It's okay. Kind of 
probably would have rather used a phthalo blue. But um, just testing my color, just, just a lime green. Um, I'm going to dilute it more than this when I actually use Let's it. Let's go out. <coughs> <coughs> And so I'm just gonna use like, I'm just touching this with my brush. I'm not like dipping it. Just want the tiniest bit on the tip of my brush. And I'm just gonna like, I'll call this dabbing. Like I'm just gonna dab this green in here. And like, it's, I mean, it's very detailed, but I don't think I'm being super precious about it. I think I'm just, um, just kind of dabbing it around in kind of a, almost like a stabbing motion. I think that gives me a lot of control with a super dry brush. Okay, so that's interesting. Like I thought I had mixed, um, this is why color is relative, people. I thought I mixed a pretty green, lime green, but now that I put it on here, I feel like next to the colors I've already used, like it does not look green enough. So just gonna go over it again. I mean, this is the thing with watercolor is like, you know, the colors are mixing on the paper through the layering process anyway, but this is the key. I can always go darker, like I can make this green, um, like darker green, bluer green, but I can't go back and make it yellow again. That would be impossible with watercolor. Um, you can go darker, but you can't go lighter. So look, I'm gonna just add some more of this. That looks way better to me. I'll hold it up in a second. I'm getting the shadow from the phone. So that's how it looks right now. With the green in there. So, so my shadows are a lot paler. Is that something I can rectify? Yes, but also like, this is always the case with the, um, with the video course. Like my phone is making this higher contrast than okay. it is in real life. And okay. in addition, I actually wish I'd make these a little lighter because now we get nervous. I'm like, oh, I made it too dark because you can't make it lighter later. So if you think yours are too light, that's not a bad thing. You can definitely make it darker later. But um, yeah, if I, if I, hopefully this will work out. But okay, if thank it's you. True that I made this too too dark, then not much I can do about it. But let's just see, because we've got some layers to go. Maybe it'll be fine. I was um, that's like one thing I always get kind of nervous about. So why don't we um, add in this kind of like brownish ochre okay. yellow that. Um, that changes color at the um, center of the petal. Let's work on that now. So let's see, how are you gonna make that color? So that's gonna be yellow. Mm -hmm. 
So I have a yellow ochre. Would that be okay? Um, so I'm going to mix this color from the yellow that I've been using already. Okay. Because I like sticking to the transparent pigments and um, for the layering technique and also, well, yeah, that's the main reason because yellow ochre is like a quite um, opaque pigment. Oh, I see. But like also, you know, you can also just give it a try. I actually don't even have a yellow ochre with me right now, so I can't try that. But um, you could try that and just see how you like it. So right now I'm just mixing the yellow directly with this um, Cronacridone purple because um, like mixing purple with yellow usually gives you uh, brown. And this, I think, could be a little bit cooler. So I'll just add also a little bit of blue. A little bit of daylight blue. Even if you use yellow ochre from your pigments, um, just you know, test it out and make sure that it's the color you really want. You can also use that as a starting point and adjust from there, like how I've been making these adjustments as I go, as I mix the colors. <clears throat> so I think I'm pretty happy with this. <laughs> So I'm gonna I'm gonna add this in freehand because it has this kind of like a jagged edge to it. So I think um, adding it freehand will work well for me. But again, I just need to really control the amount of water that I have on my brush. So that I can just you get this texture here. Somebody has like their TV on or something and they're unmuted. Okay, I think I figured it out. So I'm just using the brush, the very tip of the brush to pull out these shapes. Just in a loose way, you know. <clears throat> One thing that you just want to be careful of is that you don't make the pattern like too even because then it'll uh, it just won't look organic anymore. Like you don't wanna have these little spikes that are sticking out. You don't wanna have them like evenly spaced, for example.
Then we will be adding another layer of the lemon yellow over the top of this so that it will become like more blended. Uh, okay. We'll just hold that up. Um, you, you might not think that this looks particularly great at this particular moment, but you know what? Um, sometimes that happens with the layering process and um, it's going to come together. So I'm just going to build up a little more of the lemon yellow now. I'm going to be really careful when I go towards the center of the petal because I want this to blend a little bit, but I don't want to disturb too much what I've already done. Um, so this is just going to make um, the petals start to look a little more opaque. And it's also going to just blend a little bit make this texture or like pattern that's on the petals uh, just look a little less abrupt. Uh, I guess it's not texture, I guess it's more like a pattern. If we had real like visible highlights, we'd also be avoiding those right now. It's pretty hard to see in this flower. And if you are able to make them out, yeah, avoid the highlights. <laughs> yeah, not that difficult with this flower, difficult to say. <clears throat> So is is the color you're putting on now quite quite translucent, quite lots of water? Yes. So like every single layer that I've done so far has been very transparent. Okay. I'm just I'm building things up very gradually, not all at once. Maybe I will. This middle part a little lighter, like on couple a couple of the petals. I'm just since I'm really looking for it now. If you notice that there's some places, like maybe in the center of a petal, that is lighter, um, with this next layer of yellow, just paint around. Just leave those areas with only one layer. Paint around. It's like, I mean, that is so subtle. It's quite difficult to see on the camera. That's what I've done. Maybe just, just leave a couple there. Um, okay. Uh, I wanna make sure that that's dry, but I want to paint, um, some of these smaller areas that are still white. Let's get into this though. Just moving some of the lemon yellow over to this area here. Just like, I'm just letting it touch the green that I had before. I'm not even mixing them together, but I just think for the center area, So 
So because I'm using this layering process, like right now going over with the lighter yellow um, that is surrounded by the lime green, I don't even have to be that careful. I mean, in fact, I want to maybe have a tiny bit of overlap in some places just to give the whole thing, like a lot of times with this organic subject matter, it's like you actually want it to look a little bit uneven. So sometimes just letting things overlap a little bit, it adds to that effect. So, okay. Um, and now I'm going to use actually my other yellow. The, I'm now using the yellow that is warm and opaque. It's like a cadmium yellow. Um, if you do not have a warm yellow, um, you could take like the most opaque yellow that you have and add just like a tiny, tiny bit of orange to it or a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of red to it. Um, so I need to hold this up for you to see. I mean, I could have just done this like huge, right? And then you guys could have all seen it, but I don't know. I guess this is just the way I would normally paint, and that's why I did it. So I hope you can see the way that the different yellows are interacting, like how this more orange, warm yellow. Um, does have a little bit of contrast against this cooler lemon yellow. And I think that's probably like one of the really nice things about this painting right now, but it's extremely subtle. And I mean, it's the case in the photograph too, right? <coughs> um, you have to really look because all the parts of the flower are yellow, but they're it's different shades of yellow. And at first, it might just look like one yellow circle. Um, if you look at it from far away, and then the closer you look at it, you might think like, oh, I see different petals because I can see the shadows now they cast. And then you say like, oh, I can see the stamen and the pistils and the and the anthers because I can see um, that they are different shades of yellow um, when you start to look really closely. So that could just be your experience looking at a flower and that, um, that could maybe be enhanced by the experience of painting the flower. Getting into the habit of like, noticing these really fine details. So I think I'm just gonna add like a little more of the lemon yellow just in certain areas. And then what we're gonna wanna do is finally at the end, adjust the contrast. Um, Someone was asking earlier, like, can I make things darker? And still, and yes, you can. So that will happen um, just in a moment when we are just doing uh, some adjusting for contrast. Um, because I'm using a transparent yellow, it does take a few layers just to build up the color itself. So I'm adding a little more yellow in some places where it's just like the color is the most intense. If you happened to be using 
like a more um, opaque yellow. You might not even need to do that. Um, another thing we can do, like now that certain areas are darker, I just, I, there are like a couple areas where I'd like to lift a little bit of the yellow. So, I mean, this is kind of a more advanced thing, but actually I'll just show you. Um, if you scrub a little bit with a damp brush in an area where you've built up quite a few layers, you can actually lift a little bit of the paint. It's just a couple petals started to look a little bit flat to me, so I thought that could um, just make it a little more dimensional. Okay, so now I'm ready for my contrast adjustment layer. I'm going to actually switch to an even smaller brush for this. And I want to make sure I've got some of my original shadow color available. <clears throat> so now the water has completely evaporated. I just added a little more water. Don't make it so equal. So that is fine because now in this final, final adjustment of contrast, uh, we're going to be using thicker paint and I'm going to switch to a number one brush. <clears throat> So yeah, again, like, especially now that we've accumulated several layers here, um, you really want to make sure that you do not um, add too much water on top of this now. So using a small brush, it doesn't hold a lot of water in the first place. And um, like to be on the safe side, you can dry off your brush and just dip the very tip of it into your color or like if you have got something a pan like what I have here where the pool of color is down at the bottom just taking a little bit of color from here um, this flat part it just means um, <clears throat> yeah that you just get a tiny bit on the tip of your brush so I mean this part is pretty fun I'm just gonna go in and now pull back out some areas of high contrast and detail. Not going over all the shadows that I did in the beginning. And I'm gonna pull these little shadows back out again. probably just paying a little closer attention than I did the first time too.
I will hold this up in a minute. I realize this is so tiny. Um, so hope you can see how it's really starting to pop a lot more now. Which is these few darker shadows. Now that I've done this, I feel like I also want to have some darker shadows in the green part, this lime green. So I'm just going to um, go back to my lime green and add a little more blue. And again, not going over everything. Just in certain areas. So I think this is pretty much done. Um, probably would look nice with some of the leaves around it to make the yellow stand out from the paper more. <clears throat> Um, does anybody have any questions? Um, I will be right back. I'm actually going to run to the bathroom. And then we'll talk a little bit more about everyone's paintings.
Uh, while I have you as a captive audience while you're finishing your paintings, I'd love to tell you a little bit about the spring botanical watercolor workshop that's going to take place um, starting Tuesday online. Um, we will have a different specimen every week um, over the course of six weeks and we'll learn many different watercolor techniques. Um, I've got some people in the class who who are regulars who have been painting for a while and then uh, we've always got a couple of complete beginners as well um, so anybody at any level is welcome and um, like how this class has been I think that um, I hope that for someone who is new to botanical watercolor um, that you got enough guidance to um, to create something and learn some new techniques um, that might be surprising to you today. And um, for those of you that might be more advanced, um, I go much deeper into like the color theory and specific pigments. And um, one of the things that I didn't do today, but that we often do during the regular workshops is talk more about um, the history of botanical illustration, um, its connection to medicinal plants, and um, also talking a little bit more about the botany um, aspect of individual specimens. <clears throat> and um, also giving opportunities for people to collect their own specimens and paint from life which is um, always a really nice experience. So um, yeah, I'd love to invite you all to join um, if you hadn't thought about it already. I think it's gonna be a really great class because there's so many different plants to draw during the spring. Um, so the online workshops, like I always do it, do this, choose the specimens according to the seasons. So um, at least if you happen to live like in, in Europe or North America, quite a lot of the specimens that I choose tend to be things that you could easily find near you. Um, I tend not to paint a lot of like exotic or cultivated plants, but rather focus on on wild plants, um, even weeds, but um, yeah, you'd be surprised how much there still is um, on offer, even within those mo more modest categories. Um, so yeah, please consider joining, if not this time, maybe another time. And um, I